Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavanis Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavanis. Our guest today is Leslie Vanette. Leslie, are you ready to be great today? I am ready to be great today. Leslie is currently the new business development director for British Platform as a service company. She also creates custom sales playbooks as a founder of Sales Team Builder. She is passionate about sales and committed to making sales a more inclusive, respected profession. She ne- connects with and inspires the next generation of sales professionals on her TikTok channel, at sales tips, sales tips talk. When she's not selling or take or talking about sales, you can find her on a soul cycle bike, reading, cooking, planning an vacation, or spending time with her family in her homestead of Montana. Leslie, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me, Jason. I'm really excited about this conversation. So Leslie, um, what is a soul cycle bike? What, 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 what you can you can actually kind of see it in my background over there. Um, it's, I mean, it's a Peloton bike with a different name. So it's like, okay. the brand would probably hate me for, for saying that. Um, but I am a huge fan of community in, in all of its forms. And we all have a way to tap into it, whether it's a live sporting event or maybe at a a concert. Uh, And for me, a really important way of tapping into that sense of like shared energy and community is getting into a soul cycle class. And obviously I prefer to be there in person, but the last year has prevented that. So I got the bike, I put on my uh, noise canceling headphones. And, you know, I think if anybody walked by me, they'd be like, ma'am, are you okay? But it brings me a lot of joy. So is this kind of like a spin class type of thing? Yeah, totally. Exactly right. And and they're at least in person? Yeah. So there are in-person classes and um, they're starting to open back up as, as the world open back up, opens back up, which is so exciting. Um, and then they stream classes and also have classes on demand. So it's, um, I feel like it's for me, just an, an like easy access to a huge boost of energy I'm just, you know, sitting right behind me in my home office. And how long have you been doing it? About four years oh, now. So, so, so you're probably dedicated. Almost, you're, you're committed. Yeah, then. probably almost four years to the day. Yeah, I've done um, over 500 classes. So. Whoa. <laughs> so next, where's, where's your first vacation going to be when you go on vacation? Have you got something planned out already? Since you know, the- we have, we have. I don't want to call it my vacation. I would say it's my husband's vacation that I am going on. He is turning 40 this year, huge milestone birthday. I wanted to make it really special. And he's um, just like a fishing, I don't know, aficionado, a fishing aficionado. Um, He loves deep sea fishing, clearly being in a landlocked state that is Illinois, we don't get to do that often. So we're gonna head down to Costa Rica for six days and he's gonna do two days of inland fishing and two days of deep sea fishing. Man, that's gonna be great for him. But I'm sure you make it great for yourself. I'm (laughs) sure you'll find a way to make yourself great for you too. Well, as you mentioned in my bio, I love, love, love to read. I just devour books. So I anticipate that um, time being spent by the pool, maybe with a cocktail with an umbrella in it, reading some books. And your husband's also from Montana? He isn't. He's from upstate New York. Oh, wow. (laughs) We met in Chicago at my very first job uh, when I moved here and dated uh at work as co-workers and kept it very under wraps for years actually years um and then much to the surprise and dismay of all of our colleagues we announced that we were dating and then you know like a year later announced we were engaged (laughs) so that's good stuff yeah it's been Um, a good ride do you still work or volunteer with the Chicago Children's Museum? If you do, can you tell you about your role about that? With that, I do. Oh, Jason, thanks so much for asking. I um, just actually stepped down as the co-president of the Associates Board of the Chicago Children's Museum. I'm still on the board, and uh, I moved into a role heading up their volunteer activities. The museum is set to reopen in July, so we're going to ramp up that need for for folks to come in and volunteer. Um, the work that I do or, or my focus in volunteerism is um, in addition to you know, 
just sort of facilitating the play um, that the, the kids come in and, and appreciate so much is raising funds to help folks that uh, otherwise wouldn't be able to afford the ticket price to the museum. So uh, um, about 30% of the children that visit the museum each year either come steeply discounted or for free, um, thanks to the work of all the, the folks that support me and support the museum. So it's it's a really incredible place with, uh, I think, a mission that's easy to identify with, whether or not you are a kid or have kids. And it's that play is truly fundamental to living a, a full life and fundamental to our growth and development. So I think that resonates for adults too. So there's other, so you do other things to give back to the community. Why is this whole point for you to give back to the community? I do, yeah. I... I mean, for a lot of reasons, Jason, I, I think one of them is that the brass tax is that I'm pretty privileged. Like it's, it, you know, it's, it's um, I think been easier for me to find success in life, easier for me than, than other folks that maybe haven't had some of this, the same privilege. And that doesn't mean that everything's been easy. Surely not. I've had to, to um, you know, fight and work hard for, for what's mine, but I, I just feel very called to something bigger than myself. And when I look at where I feel like the biggest impact it's going to, is going to come from, it's, it's really kids. So the Chicago Children's Museum allows me to support play. Uh, also for many years was on the board of a Chicago Collegiate Charter School to support the mission of getting more kids graduated and accepted to college and then through college. So we're putting graduates back into underprivileged communities. I go and spend my weekends judging debate rounds in middle schools and, and high schools just to support that. Um, uh, it, it, you know, kind of proven extracurricular that helps build rhetoric skills and helps build confidence. So a calling, that sounds kind of cheesy, but <laughs> I mean, that's what it is. So we're going to talk about your social media presence in more detail later for your TikTok. But one thing I love and it makes my dad just like die laughing, like when you go on, on TikTok and, and you repeat what people post on LinkedIn, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, like, it's just so hilarious. Do you, you think, are these people really putting this out there or are these being kind of sarcastic? Like one time somebody put, a starter founder put, you know, um, I, I parked in the last very, like a mile away from the job. So I have the best job to work at. Another person put like, you did like 20,000 things in one day. It's like hilarious how you find this stuff, right? So first, how do you find this stuff? I mean, of course it's kind of easy, it's everywhere. And then what, what's the purpose of pushing, putting that out there? Like, I think it's hilarious, I died laughing. <laughs> I think part of it is just so when we when we think about TikTok, what you're supposed to do on on TikTok is inspire, educate, entertain, right? And I had a ton of content that was educational and inspirational, but I was missing a bit of that entertain piece because I'm not trying to get on TikTok and like do a dance or it, that's just not who I am. I wouldn't feel comfortable or confident doing that. So I said what is entertaining that is is still linked to kind of my mission and, and my professional brand. And I spend a lot of time on LinkedIn. I talk a lot about LinkedIn and, and help folks sort of, you know, build their presence there, get hired faster using LinkedIn. And I realized I was coming across these absurd posts. Like you mentioned a founder saying, I woke up at 3.30 in the morning and hit the gym for four hours. Yes, said, it. that's it right there. That's <laughs> it, that's the one. <laughs> <laughs> you did for four hours? Like, really? Like, that, I don't know if I believe that or not. That one was by far my favorite because the, the guy continues to go on and say, you know, I'm on my way to China and I answered three phone calls in line that's, and then that's the, that's sent the a one. few. E it was so absurd and so braggadocious. And it made me sort of a light went on in terms of how many of those types of posts I was seeing that were so braggadocious and, and perpetuating this toxic hustle culture that we should be on all the time. And that everybody needs to wake up at 2 a.m. and go to sleep at midnight to be successful. Um, and what really irked me about it is that you look at the bottom of the post, Jason, and it's 273 likes. And, and people were buying into it. And, and so I took those posts and took those stories to LinkedIn or to TikTok and, and did these dramatic readings to 
poke fun at these people that are, are taking themselves so seriously and to call out some of that bad behavior that we should not be celebrating this just utter nonsense of people patting themselves on the back um, and like perpetuating a, a culture and a work environment that isn't healthy. Yeah, I don't know if Professor Athlete spoke out four hours a day from 3.30 <laughs> to 7.30, you know. I don't think their trainers would let them. Yeah, that, that, that's just hilarious how you find that. Well, only one, and I know you would never do this, but man, it would be so great if you actually tagged them so everyone could go look at the profile. Like, you know, like John Brown said, what? Let me go look at his profile. What's he doing, right? I know. <laughs> People ask me all the time, like, who is it? Drop name, spill the yeah. T. And I, I would never. But yeah. um, to your question in terms of how do I find them, I find a lot of them on my own news feed. But um, now that I did the first series and it was so successful, people send them to me. So <laughs> shout out to all so, of our listeners today. So all the people are dropping dimes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> send me the, the best posts you find. And uh, I'm working on another, like the third iteration in that series right now. So coming soon and hopefully, you know, something you send yeah, will be You almost need to turn that into like an ebook, or a book down the road, you know. That would be hilarious. Just the most ridiculous things I've read on LinkedIn. So let's talk about LinkedIn for a minute. So for me, first, I have a like, love-hate relationship with LinkedIn. Like you need to find, find a job, start your business. I mean, I don't know how anyone does anything business-wise without it, right? However, comma, the stuff they do sometimes, right? The, like the UX is not the best. So like the, in, like they um, uh, influence you not to connect with people, right? And my biggest pet peeve, like we talked before in pre-talk, LinkedIn a lot, right? My thing, if you go to Instagram, Facebook, any TikTok, first day, no users, your ex is alive. LinkedIn Live, you got to have, I don't know, like the, I don't know, President Trump or like President Obama, like some big wig, you know, like <laughs> Jack Dorsey. I, I just don't get it why they open that up to everyone. I just, it's frustrating. Yeah, it's weird that they gatekeep it so much because you think that there would be automatic parameters like TikTok, once you hit a thousand followers, you get access to live. They could easily do something like that. But uh, yeah, I shared that I had applied a few days ago and I was hoping I could stream for this, but haven't heard back yet. I agree, Jason, it is a love-hate relationship, more love because I have had so, I've experienced so much benefit from the platform in terms of connections made and, and knowledge that I've soaked up and, um, like I've been headhunted for my last three jobs as a direct result of, of LinkedIn. So there's a lot of love, but the algorithm is very confusing when it's, uh, I, I posted something recently that I logged on to LinkedIn and my newsfeed was advertisement, LinkedIn poll, advertisement, advertisement, LinkedIn poll, LinkedIn poll. And the polls were like, how do you like your coffee? And I think they're incentivizing bad content, which is, isn't good for anybody. Um, and then they're, they're incentivizing you to only connect with people that you've met in real life, which is very counterintuitive to I a agree. brand that is like a global virtual networking platform. So some of it doesn't make sense, but I'm going to still say it's more good than bad. Yeah, I agree with you. It gives me like some people tell you like, like, I don't know you. I'm not going to go LinkedIn. Well, so you're telling me if I met you in a live in-person networking event, you're going to tell me, oh, I don't know you. I'm not going to connect with you. Right. I refuse just, to I shake your hand. <laughs> yeah, I don't know you. Have someone introduce you to me. Like, I, I don't get it, right? <laughs> and another thing, I have a friend who has a shares a story. So her, my friend, her husband came to visit me last weekend, and we took a picture from the Space Needle. She had one post. It was just business related, right? Nothing fun, just business related. And a two, like five views, nothing on it. A week later, she posted the Space Needle post in Seattle. Hey, I met Jason first time, blah, blah, you know, you know, Facebook kind of thing, like 3000 views. Right. Yes. So most like they're almost, you know, incentivizing the Facebook like posts versus what we call like LinkedIn post, I guess. It's, it's interesting. I think part of it is this evolution in, in business, not just on LinkedIn, where we're all being encouraged to be more authentic and bring our full self to work. And that's fine in premise but it's supposed to be a professional networking platform and a professional knowledge sharing platform. And I think both the content creators as well as the algorithm are struggling to, to sort of find their way and find their, their North star on that journey. So the best example I have of that, like, this happened like a few years ago. 
the, the younger lady was on LinkedIn. She put a video. She's, I mean, I guess she came just out of the shower with a towel on. She was playing how to go seek with German Shepherd, right? For like two minutes. That's all she did play how to go seek. Oh, and, and people were like, well, what is this nonsense? And somebody asked her, well, she wants to show potential pros that she has a bubby personality. I'm like, I don't know about that, right? But it's like, yeah. It's so interesting. I just commented on, uh, oh, Jesus. I just broke Hi. something here. Um, I just commented on a post yesterday uh, and it was a woman calling out another woman who had a, a LinkedIn profile picture that was, I, I wouldn't say it was racy, like she was covered up, but it was very, very tight fitting clothes, kind of a like a low cut thing. And she was saying, you know, how inappropriate it was that she didn't have a more professional profile picture up. And she put that post where everyone could see it. Yeah. And I was, that's what I, that's what I don't get. Stuff like that. I, you like do a DM or something. I, it was a little, I was a little, like, this is kind of a touchy subject. Cause like on one side, should she be able to, to wear whatever she feels most comfortable and confident in? Absolutely. On the other side, as like a young, she was a young professional, as a young professional that once kind of fell into that trap of being told by others or, or sort of feeling from society that I had to use my like assets as a woman to get a seat at the table. I kind of looked at the picture and was like, oh, don't do it. Like you're better than this. So it's, um, yeah, I don't know. It's, it's a platform that continues to evolve and I hope that they get it right. Like I, I hope that they train the algorithm to put out content that actually improves everybody's knowledge instead of just shows a bubbly personality. <laughs> yes. So from your point of view, your perspective, what are people getting wrong about using LinkedIn versus like job hunters or like people starting a business or just in general, what are people doing wrong on it? Yeah. So one thing I see, this might be a slightly more sales specific example, but one thing I see is folks using it as a sales channel instead of a networking channel. So they get on there, they, they start their profile, you know, they put in, they put in a picture in their like most recent job, and then they just start connecting and spamming people. Yeah. We've all had it. You can, you connect with someone two minutes later. Hi, Jason, I'm blah, 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 Correct. blah, 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 blah. Like, and 20,000 words later, you're like, what is this? You know? Absolutely. And, and, and then you say, you know, even if, and I, no, you usually don't answer, you could just say, hey, I don't have time for this, or like, I'm not interested, or I have an internal team. Oh, I, I was glad you have an internal team, but I'm sure my team can outperform yours or some crap like that, right? Yeah. Or you get the ones where you say no, thank you, and they come back really aggressively, like, what, why aren't you interested or where they just send you like 17 messages in a row and you never respond. So I feel like there's a lot of that. Uh, the, the, the group sales hacker has a really good sort of like do's and don'ts thing um, that anybody should, should check but sometimes out. Sometimes I don't wonder, does that work sometimes? Cause why would they do this over people do it over and over again? Does it actually work on some people? So I've talked to some people that, that do it. It's the same as I'm sure you've seen this as well, Jason, where people drop their Calendly links in. Okay. It's like somebody reaching out to you cold and they're like, just schedule below. You do the work prospect that I haven't qualified and never met and took <laughs> absolutely no time to even like read your, your bio. Um, so I think it's one of those things where they, they do it so much that yes, it does work, but it's like, if you send out your Calendly link a thousand times, or you send out this generic automated message a thousand times and you book five meetings from it, did, did it work? <laughs> like, I know you booked five meetings, but how many people did you burn along the way? How many people are going to remember that you aggressively prospected them with irrelevant, unpersonalized content? Um, so I, th I think that people say that results come from it, but they're confusing a couple of yeses and, and limited results with actually having success using the technique. Um, yeah. so I, I would say that's the number one thing I see folks. And you're right. A lot, of people do, a lot of people don't even are so lazy. don't take the time to qualify anything. Like, like the last two months, I got an email from a, from an HR company in Louisiana. Right. But my, my company, Kevin's HR, I'm building an HR tech company. 
why are you sending me stuff and telling me to buy your HR? I just, I just don't get it. I don't reply or nothing. They send me all this stuff, you know, but I mean, just, it's just hilarious to me, right? Like, yeah, that's one of my, my favorite ones is the people that are like, would you like to learn how to use LinkedIn to sell? I'm like, well, I'm, I'm an actual LinkedIn selling expert. Um, but thanks so much for your generic in mail. Yeah. It's, 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 <laughs> it's ridiculous. So don't do that. But what you should do instead is connect with people that you're excited to learn from, uh, engage with their posts, post your own content. Um, e even if you don't feel comfortable being like a content creator and, and sort of posting original stuff, find posts that you gravitate towards and reshare them with your own thoughts to get started. So do use it as a, a, a way to build your community and to connect with folks that you're excited to network with and excited to learn from. So do the networking piece. Don't do the connect and spam piece. Leslie, can you talk about the parts of active listening for people in sales? Oh man. Yes. I did, maybe just saw the video I posted or you have excellent time or you're a mind reader, Jason. I don't know. All, all the above. <laughs> all the above. So one of the things that I coach on really often is like just using silence, I think is, is part of it. And asking a question and instead of your brain running with what you're going to say next, take the time to absorb what, you know, what the person is saying. Um, I always recommend that people take notes because I find that if they're sitting there taking a note, it helps them focus on the response the person is giving uh, versus what they're going to, to say next. But at the end of the day, active listening is important in, in any profession, right? I mean, you as, as an HR expert certainly know how important listening is and truly deeply listening. And what I find in, in sales is that so often folks ask a single question and then somebody will be halfway through the answer and they're ready to ask their next question or they're ready to start selling them again. And it does more harm than just asking no questions at all. Um, because as, as humans, it's off-putting when somebody interrupts us and it's off-putting when we don't feel like we're being listened to, right? So I think active listening is extraordinarily important in all professions or even in interpersonal relationships. I think in sales, it's especially important that you really use that information that you're getting to create a better value match, to probe deeper, to, to truly uncover what a, a prospect's needs are. Um, and it just, it feels better. It feels better as a salesperson to listen and connect. And it feels better for your, your buyer, your prospect, if you're listening to them and connecting. So let's, I could be wrong about this, but why is there no like sales degrees in college? Like there's marketing, regular business, but I don't think there's any sales degree, right? Why? I think it's a disservice. Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, there are, are about a, that? no, you are not wrong. There are a handful, like an actual, just a, like maybe a dozen programs that are sales programs. You can get a degree in, in sales right now. Um, and there are some entrepreneurship programs that tie in a sales course here and there, but honestly, they're much more focused on business to consumer sales. There's a, a kind of missed trick with the B2B sales piece, even though most of the sales people that really are, are sales professionals are in, in B2B. I, I think about this a lot, Jason. So it's, it's interesting that you asked the question. I find that there's like an element of shame for some people in saying that they're in sales. I see this a lot, interestingly, with my British colleagues that they don't, like somebody's like, what do you do for a job? And I'd say, oh, I'm a B2B sales professional. And they'd say, I'm in procurement or I'm in tech or you know, I'm in finance. They'd, they'd say the type of industry they sell into versus the actual profession that they are in. So, you know, I think, think part of that is that salespeople just have such a bad reputation that there's some shame or some hesitation in saying, yeah, I am in sales. I raise my hand. I'm, I'm proud of the job um, that I do. And that 
then trickles down to the types of degrees that people would want to pursue. And one of the reasons I went to TikTok was to inspire that next generation of sales professionals. And hopefully if we can start reaching folks at a younger age and highlighting sales as an inclusive place to work, as a respected profession, we can get more folks asking for sales degrees and then we can get you know better training at a collegiate level. Is, is being a great salesperson something that just comes, should just come naturally to people or something you have to like learn and like put in the work every day? Or is like some people just natural salesmen, salespeople? A little bit of both. I think there are a lot of soft skills that I see over and over again in great salespeople, sort of regardless of what point they're at in their career or what type of sales they're in. And those are soft skills like being naturally curious um, it, like having a want to help others. I think there is some of that, that grit and that entrepreneurialism. And those tend to be very internal traits, very, you know, soft skill, um, driven traits, everything else you can pretty much be taught. So, if you want to be truly great at sales, you're going to need to learn, grow, put in the work every single day. But if you want to know, hey, is sales a career that I would enjoy? Ask yourself, are you curious? Do you like to be creative? Do you like to help people? Do you have that, that sort of entrepreneurial mindset? Um, and then the answer is probably yes. So let's suppose a small business owner or founder, where the case would be, is going to bring on a sales team. How should they pay these people? So you'd be like straight commission, salary, a combination? What order would be your preferred method? Oof, that's a tough question because I have pretty strong opinions about commission only jobs. And I think there it's kind of an unpopular opinion, honestly, but that's okay. I'm comfortable having unpopular opinions. Uh, I don't think Jason, and, and maybe I'm wrong. You, you tell me if there's anybody else in a company that you would ever ask to work for free. No. There isn't, right? So why are we asking salespeople to, to do that? And, and I get that the business owner is strapped, likely, right? They're probably working on a, a pretty tight budget. Um, and I understand the philosophy of you, you take a piece of what you make for the company. That's all fine and dandy. But we would never ask anybody else to work for free. It's, I, I just think, absolutely a, a travesty that folks find it acceptable to ask salespeople to work for free. And beyond that, it creates an environment where there is a lack of psychological safety. Like you are going in every single day hungry and, and maybe willing to push through a deal that's not quite right, or maybe willing to, to compromise some of the brand integrity or your personal integrity, because you know, if you don't close that sale, you don't get to eat, pay your bills, buy medicine. I don't know. Um, but it's, I do not agree with the commission only. Um, so for you, it'd be some kind of combination then? I, I like a hybrid structure. I also think that most salespeople are very heavily incentivized on the, the harder you work, the better you are, the more you get paid. So in my career, I found that a, a hybrid base, like livable, safe base, plus a, a you know, exciting commission structure works best for folks. And if salespeople, they're pretty much the only people in the country who, who can like, if they work more or perform better, they're gonna get paid more, correct? Them and the executives. Yeah, cool. Um, who are some salespeople you follow? Ooh, uh, my favorite, favorite person is Josh Braun, which a lot of folks will probably recognize his name. Uh, he's been my mentor for a couple of years and I don't always agree with all of his sales advice, but um, I think that's one of the things I love about sales is that there are so many different ways to, to get there. There are so many different ways to sell. Um, and so I, I really always appreciate his perspective. I would recommend him and it's Braun, B-R-A-U-N. Um, Andy Paul is another mentor who I think is an incredible voice in sales. He also spends a lot of, of time um, talking about the importance of inclusivity 
in sales, which I really appreciate because if I'm being honest, that's not something that many like six-year-old white men dedicate so much of their time and energy to, to putting in the forefront and to amplifying those voices. Um, there is a, a newer voice, a woman called Gabrielle Blackwell, who's a SDR leader at a company called Gong, who I'm just really loving her content. Um, Nikki Ivy, I really love as well. And these are all people that you can, can look up on LinkedIn. They all have a great, um, a great LinkedIn presence. There's a new friend on TikTok that's putting out sales content, which is exciting because I'm like, you're hey, not the, sales. You're not, you're not the only one. Not anymore, Jason. It's so exciting. So you have to follow my friend, Will, who just renamed his channel and it is now just one minute sales and just one min sales. Um, so that's really exciting to see another like B2B sales voice on, on TikTok. Um, but I think maybe I would say, Jason, that there are a lot of people, particularly on LinkedIn, who may not align, their sales advice may not align to your values. Put them to the side because you will find your community on, on LinkedIn. And it took me a little while because I felt like my feed was just all advice that, that kind of felt gross, didn't feel like it aligned with the way I sell best, didn't, didn't align with how I want to make my buyers, my prospects feel. Um, so whenever you're looking for people to follow, make sure that they've done it. They've been in the trenches and they, you know, they've done that job um, for a while. And you know, make sure that, um, that their advice feels good to you. Leslie, is sales sales? What I mean is like, if someone sells a refrigerator, they should be able to sell our house. They should be able to like do B two B B two B sales, or each type of sales has its own unique skills and sets. Ooh, this is another tough question. Gosh, you're you're really coming at me this <laughs> afternoon, Jason. Um, I think fundamentally, yes, sales is sales is sales because of those sort of soft skills or those internal traits that I, I mentioned earlier. Those are are largely transferable regardless of what you're selling. Where I see folks really struggle to leap between sales is a tangible versus intangible sale. So that that's one thing I've really, um, like uh, on the side, we, we were talking about this, but I make custom sales playbooks for, for teams. And that's one thing that, that I would say, especially folks that are selling very tangible products like a refrigerator, they struggle to embrace some of um, like the lead with emotion, follow with facts, sort of selling philosophy that we, we know just psychologically and based on data works best, but that you see a lot more often in the intangible space. Um, so I'd, I'd say that's one transition that, that folks struggle with is tangible v. intangible. Um, and certainly there are some nuances in, in B2, B2C business to consumer and B2B business to business. But at the end of the day, sales is sales is sales. And I, you know, I think the skills are largely transferable and more recruiters and HR people should give salespeople a chance to try something new. So what's your advice for this person? There's probably millions of people out there like this. They, they have the list qualified, everything they've done the research, everything set. They just have to start making calls, but yeah. they always make excuse not to make the call. Something else comes up, something else comes up. You know, uh, you know why do so many people not just pick the call, call the phone up and call? Yeah, because it's scary. It's scary. I still, I mean, I, I have 13 years of experience on the phone and a lot of it was spent cold calling, like truly cold calling. There was no computer on my desk. Like I just had a stack of, of phone numbers and I was just on the phone all, all day. So even with that experience, cold calling is still a bit nerve wracking. So I think give yourself a, a bit of grace. Like it's okay to be nervous. It's okay to maybe like be a bit sweaty, be a bit clammy. Um, you don't have to get it right every time. 
um, I'll never forget year, years ago, I was cold calling and it was around the holidays. And I think I'd watched the movie Elf with, with Will Ferrell, you know, that one. So good. I think I'd probably watched it already like 45 times that season. Um, and there's a, a part where the Norwal comes out of the water and he says, bye buddy. I hope you find your dad. And for whatever reason, I hung up a call with the prospect and I said, bye, John, I hope you have a good day. And everybody on the sales floor just looked at me. I was like, I, I mean, just whatever it is, what it is. So, I mean, (laughs) you're going to make mistakes. It's okay to be silly. You're not going to get it right. Every time, give yourself permission to learn from those mistakes. Give yourself a little bit of grace that it is a cold call. You, you could only be so prepared. So you're, you're not going to nail it hundred percent of the time and then take action like pick up the phone and do it, put your cold calls at the beginning of the day so that you force yourself to get them done. Um, Kiss the frog as, as Peter Turlow would say. Um, But yeah, take, take actions, the best advice. So Leslie, tell me if you agree with this. I can't remember where I read this or heard it, but I read somewhere the purpose of doing the call is not actually to get the call because a chance of actually answering the call is probably slim to none. The real thing is like get on the voicemail, right? And leave a voice message. challenge that a little bit. I think in the context of a a larger outreach cadence where it's, you know, email, phone call, LinkedIn touch point, email, email, phone call, LinkedIn, you are not expecting obviously the prospect to answer every time you call. That's why you have a a multi, uh, you know, a multi touch point cadence. And in that context, I'm leaving a voicemail, not because I think they're going to return my voicemail, but because I want to point them to the email I sent or to the LinkedIn and invite that I sent. With that being said, even in this organization right now, which I would say has probably a lower percentage of cold call conversions to intro meetings, about 30% of our discovery meetings, intro meetings are still set from cold calls. So they're necessary. (laughs) Um, so I think I heard recently, I read recently on LinkedIn somewhere where people said cold calling is dead, don't do it anymore. I'm presuming you you believe cold calling still has a place in the sales process, right? Yes. Kindly go back and take me in every single one of those posts so that I can let them know how darn wrong they are and why they're wrong and why they need to stop putting that nonsense out there. I mean, the, the cold calling and debt is dead is like the clickbait of sales because people have such strong opinions about it that you can post that and you know you're going to get you know a thousand views hundred likes whatever um but i think it's important to remember that just like us buyers like to be reached in different ways and there are still plenty of buyers out there that prefer the personal contact and and prefer the direct touch point of a phone call be thoughtful about what you're going to say when they pick up the phone, be thoughtful about how often you're reaching out to them and, and sort of when you're, you're reaching out to them. So, so do it right, do it with intention. Um, but if you are not cold calling, if you are not having, if you are not cold calling as a business owner or entrepreneur, and if you are not having your sales team call, like you are, are really doing the business and injustice. So Leslie, how often should a salesperson follow up? So they keep on following up until here, no, or is that a number, some magical number out there where they need to stop? Oh my gosh, that is such a topic of debate, Jason. Um, so like the, the short answer is follow up until you hear no, but the long answer is follow up until you hear no in a way that is respectful of your buyer. So that might be a 20 touch point campaign um, that's like a fast sequence campaign. And then you put them on ice for three months and, and give them some breathing room. Or that might be one of my favorite techniques are long-term nurture campaigns or uh, account-based management, ABM campaigns, which is a, a term that folks might be familiar with. It's kind of raising in popularity. But I like to make deposits slowly over the course of weeks and months where I'm showing that I am credible, I'm, I'm sharing relevant information, I'm, I'm building value, um, and I'm making a lot of gives without anything in return. And then when the timing is right for the buyer, hopefully they will 
come to me because I'm on their radar, or I have done my research to be in tune with uh, their fiscal year end, a big shift in their org structure, or a new executive leader, where then I can reach out and I know that I've made you know six months of deposits and, and I've earned the right to say, can we get on a, a call for 30 minutes? So keep reaching out until they say yes, but be sure that you are being intentional about it. Be sure that you are not just creating personalized content, but something that's relevant to them. Um, and, you know, I, I think to some extent, like help your buyer tell you when it's the right time for them to buy. Leslie, what advice you have for people who are just now breaking the sales or actually what advice you have for like salespeople in general? Salespeople in general, something I hinted at earlier, earlier that every salesperson needs to hear is sell with emotion, follow with facts. It, I, I don't know why that continues to be very difficult um, for so many in the sales profession, but people buy because you can make an impact in their lives. They don't buy because you sent them an email that said, I can increase your company's revenue by 350 million percent. They buy because you communicate to them that you can save them time. You can help them get a big win or a big promotion. You can help them reduce risk. Um, so, you know, people generally buy for the same three reasons, save time, save money, reduce risk. And those are very emotional re reasons to buy. Um, yet so often our sales conversations and our marketing collateral leads with a kind of just a list of features of the product and like, ugh. Nobody, nobody wants that. Nobody's excited about that. So lead with emotion, follow with facts. So Leslie, uh, like most salespeople, I think they need to know the own company and the company they're selling to, right? So hopefully the company they, they sell for, they get an A plus on, on, on the knowledge, right? Hopefully they do. What kind of grade should they try to start for with the business they're trying to sell to? They need like a C level knowledge, B level, A level knowledge of the company they're trying to sell to? Um, I think that depends on your sale. So I've worked in super transactional environments, like cheap price point, like, you know, 2K, 2K, 4K, 24 hour sales cycle. You do not need to know a lot about the company you're selling to in that context. You generally need to have a, a good understanding of your buyer persona so that you can ask smart questions but it would be a bad use of time in that, that sort of highly transactional fast sales cycle environment to spend 15 minutes before every call researching. Now flip to maybe something closer to, to what I'm doing now, which is a very consultative sale. It's a, a past sale, a platform as a service sale, longer sales cycle, more expensive price point, um, more stakeholders involved in the decision you have like one chance to get it right. So you, I, I mean, I can tell you that going into my intro calls, I have a, a five sort of pillar checklist that is below that very detailed. And it takes me a, about 30, sometimes 45 minutes to prepare for a discovery call. And the discovery call is maybe 45 minutes. So I, I think it is dependent on transactional versus consultative, length of sales cycle, price point, um, but whatever resources you're putting against preparing, make sure that it makes sense in, in sort of the, the outcome if they say yes. Next, can you talk about your Unleash Your Potential playbook? Yes, I can, Jason. Um, so I, back in February, uh, published a digital sales playbook and I, I was really inspired by my, like the LinkedIn and the TikTok community because I was getting a, a ton of requests for one-to-one -one coaching. And my price point, it's like my hourly price point is just not affordable for like sales newbies to, to have one-to-one -one coaching. And even if it was, I'm just sort of not... Uh, I'm not trying to go down the route of selling myself off hour by hour. I'm trying to go a, a different route with my intellectual property. Um, but I still desperately wanted to, to help and find a way to support that group of people that was asking for, for help and coaching. Um, and I, I don't have the time or resources to just like do it for free. So I poured, I spent like five months pouring a bunch of, of my knowledge um, into this playbook. And then I published it 
And then I um, set the price at like a third of what my hourly rate is to make it super accessible, super affordable, um, hopefully for, for folks. And well, so what's been the feedback on, on it so far? Oh my God, it's been amazing. Like sometimes kind of like emotional, the, the feedback is so amazing because you get, you get people, I would say that the feedback that means the most to me um, are the individuals that have reached out to me and said, I just started my first sales job and I thought that maybe like I wasn't good enough for sales or sales wasn't the right place for me until I found your TikTok channel, until I started following you, until I, I, you know, started using the playbook. And now I've realized that it's, it's not sales. It's just maybe this particular manager, or this particular environment. That's, I mean, like, that's it. That is why I do this work is to um, help that, that group of people that, that are, are, sort of struggling with a sense of otherness in sales to let them know that like their sales isn't the one job sales is is bigger there are other managers there are other workplaces that are going to value you for what you bring to the table and you know your personality and your uniqueness and these five months you put this together i'm guessing i'm gonna guess you didn't take a five month vacation to stop everything else right it's <laughs> pretty, like pretty much on the side right like you, you, i <laughs> Yeah, it's a lot. I mean, sometimes I even I'll think to myself, like, how, how are you managing your schedule? But it feels very manageable um, between work and a full time day job and the playbook and TikTok and creating custom sales playbooks. And, you know, I still need time for reading and soul cycle and all the other things I, I do. Um, I, I would say one thing that really helped is that I work for a British company, I've always worked for British companies. And something that's really common for European companies is to close down, or at least all the ones I have exposure to, is to close down for um, like Christmas Eve to New Year's. So I used that time to buckle down and really get everything out of my head and onto paper. And then it took me about six weeks after that to kind of edit it make sure that it made sense to a lay, you know, lay person, um, and, uh, then create the, the page on the teachable platform and, and get it launched and, and all of that. But it was a labor of love. So Leslie, uh, uh, another, another tech talk, talk post you did, the premise was basically entrepreneurship is not for everyone. And I, and I totally agree. Can you talk some more about that post? Yeah. So, I, I started creating that kind of series of content, Jason, because I was seeing so many videos on my FYP for you page, which is kind of the news feed of, of TikTok. They were like, just quit your job and get a new job. Just quit your job and start your own company. Quit your job and do affiliate marketing. Um, you're going to make $200,000 in your first three months. And it was, I mean, it was everywhere. It was just yeah, flooding. It doesn't work like that. It does not work like that. And, and anybody that has started a business or, or created successful income streams from something like affiliate marketing will be the, the first to tell you that it is a lot of hard work and it is a lot of consistency. Um, and you, you, know, you look at the profiles of the people that are putting out that content and what do they want you to do? They want you to enroll in their $995 class so they can teach you to set up affiliate marketing. And it just felt a bit kind of pyramid scheme-y to me. And so I wanted to, to put some content out there that was a counter voice saying, it's okay to just have a day job. Like you don't you're not worse than an entrepreneur. Cause I, I think that's part of it too, where they're like, if you, if you don't want to be an entrepreneur, then you're just lazy or you're not good enough, or not smart enough to be an entrepreneur. And I think that's nonsense. Plenty of people just want to have their, their day job and that's what makes them happy and that's enough for them. So I, you know, I think we need to not shame that. I think we need to, to put some more realistic expectations around what it means to be an entrepreneur or a solopreneur. Um, and, you know, I, I think there is a, some sort of path to entrepreneurship for, for everybody. And maybe it's something like the, the playbook, right? Like something they can do on the side that still becomes an, an income stream. But 
I think we should stop encouraging people that in the moment maybe feel lost or feel unappreciated or feel like there's something more out there for them um, to just quit their jobs on a dime without a plan or preparation. Yeah, so, so I volunteer at a nonprofit called Bunker Labs. We have like military people, like store companies. And so many of them, you know, like, oh, um, I'll be a millionaire in six months or my, my MMR would be 10,000 a day or something like crazy, right? And I think people like forget like Steve Jobs and Apple and, and Roz didn't come to Apple like eight years, right? I mean, as smart as those two people were, it took them eight years to make Apple Apple. So like, I'm not saying you can't do it, but like a lot of people need, I think need a lot more patience. You're so right. And you know what we don't talk about enough in, in our society because we constantly talk about the success stories that, you know, Tim Cook and Steve Jobs and Elon Musk. We don't talk about all of the people that started six companies and every single one of them failed. And that's a much more common story. Way more common. So it's, I, I think it's a, there's a very, very dangerous narrative happening around entrepreneurship and I, I get why it's happening. Like the employee employer relationship is uneven, unequal, unfair. We've just weathered this incredible storm in, in the pandemic and people are looking for more. So I, 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 I get where some of that, that want and maybe even desperation is coming from, but I so deeply encourage people to ground their next steps in realistic expectations and deep preparation. And of course, a funny part always is like, I'm going to start my own company because I don't want a boss. Well, let me tell you now, you're going to have more than one boss now. Your customers, your vendors, on and on and on, your boss, you know, or, you know, I, I, I don't want to work 40 hours a week. Oh, no, you, you'll never work 40 hours a week again. You work 70. At, at least, right? <laughs> yeah. And all these things that like, you know, the grass is I'm not always green. There's a solid rain on this, this thing, right? It's, yeah, it's, but, you know, it is what it is, right? Sometimes you got to learn the hard lessons. Oh, it's so true. It's so true. That cliche that's like, if you love what you do, you'll never work a day in your life. Oh, like, <laughs> it's, it's too much, Jason, because to your point, if you love what you do enough that you've decided to make it into your own business, you're going to be working every day. Yeah. I'm like me, I have a startup. I'm lucky if I get an hour or two off a day, right? You know, it's, it's, just, it's a grind and it's so, and the process is so long. I don't think people yep. realize that. Now, yep. of course, you know, if you're like already raised like $10 million before you have a, you know, or you hit the lottery, you have a, you have most people that don't have that kind of stuff, right? It's a grind. Very few people. And I think that's part of the, the dangerous narrative too, is that when you look at people that are successful, we as a society tend to pull out like the self-made man example, but most of the people that are successful, if you look at the data, they are either successful in running like a small business, like a, a landscaping, com landscaping company or like a roofing company or a dry cleaner, that's where they're successful. And when you look at the big like unicorn companies or, or tech success, which is I, I think where most of the conversations gravitate towards, they didn't come from a a desperate background most yeah, of the yeah. time. I think the two best examples are like Jeff Bezos' parents gave me three hundred thousand dollars, and Bill Gates' mother was on kind of, some kind of friend or some kind of board somewhere from IBM who got this break right. So yeah, that yeah. self-made man is like is kind of a myth a lot of times. Yeah. I think. Yeah, it's it's tough because it's it's also like so many of us. You're like, but they still worked hard. I still work hard despite what maybe has become easier to me or or the gifts I'm given. Um, and that's fine, but hard work is not going to be enough to make 99, probably 0.9% of people a, a multimillionaire. Yeah. An example of how hard it is to make it in startups and tech in general. So I, were, I know a guy, he's had three successful tech startups, sold all three of them. He, uh, he was a charge of incubator in Seattle, pretty well known, right? His last startup just fell because he's going to raise the money. I'm like, man, this guy can't raise money. Like what's going on, right? And this guy, like you would think you just will throw up and get money, right? But yeah. He didn't, raise, he didn't raise money this fourth time, right? Even yeah. with his track record. Well, I saw that um, you got accepted to WeWork Labs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sure you had a, a chance to, to meet and be exposed to a lot of different startups and have probably more than most people kind of a, a keen insight into how many people didn't even get accepted to WeWork Labs, yeah. right? And then the, of that group that did get accepted, how many weren't able to bring their their business to life 
Yeah, I think the biggest thing in that if people don't make, I think the, and this is my opinion, I think the founders sort of kind of like, like can't humble themselves too arrogant. They kind of tend to fail, right? They don't want us in advice. They don't want us in coaching. Oh, my name is Jason. I know everything about HR. You can't tell me anything, right? Those, those tend to get ignored and shunned by people, the money and people can actually help them out, right? Yeah. People want you to be able to be coached. Yeah. Ego is a killer of companies. It's a killer of sales. It's a killer of personal relationships. It's, uh, you're, no, you're, you're you so be, right. You have to be confident in your ability. You have to be some kind of confidence, but there's like the fine line, right? Between confidence is arrogance and cockiness, right? Yeah. Yeah. Confidence and humility are certainly not mutually exclusive. No. So back to LinkedIn, uh, you, I think you enjoyed this one. So a while ago, you did a post about selling a pen and the Wolf of Wall Street <laughs> responded. <laughs> like, well, you're like, why is this guy even paying attention to me? Like, you know, what's going on here? Like, like, I, I, yeah, that's pretty interesting, right? Yes, and that's I, exactly I, right. <laughs> like, are you serious right now? Yeah, it was, it was so confusing. I had posted the video uh, a month before the Wolf of Wall Street, Jordan Belfort, the actual Wolf of Wall Street did hit his reply video. So, you know, clearly I didn't think anything would come of it. It was, it's one of my most popular videos that, that I've ever posted. Um, so, I mean, it, it was great content. I was happy that, that the video did so well. And it happened to be one of those days at work where it was, you know, 8 a.m. intro meeting, 9 a.m. intro meeting, 10 a.m. intro meeting. And uh, my phone doesn't make any noise. I, I have it set up so it doesn't bother me, harass me, bully me during the day. And it's my first break after three hours of intro meetings. And I look down and it's a full screen of notifications of people on TikTok tagging me in this video. So I open it up, I, I look at it. And it's the Wolf of Wall Street replying to my video um, where I say that sell me a pen is a lazy question. Um, and I, I can tell you why. Um, and his response was along the lines of, so, so what, you're not gonna ask that question? Who, you're not gonna hire me? Who are you gonna hire, total loser? And Jason, it, it so very much validated why I think it's a lazy question, why we shouldn't be using it, why I fight so hard to make sales a more inclusive, more respected profession. Um, so to, to me and to sort of my followers and, and my community, it was it very much validated the importance of that the work that we do, um, not surprisingly to all of his followers, they were like, shut up you, sort of insert expletives are like really rude language. Um, and honestly, I, there's so many amazing sales experts to follow and so many people that set a good example and, and set an example of professionalism and honesty and respect and inclusivity that I, I don't understand the attraction to, to somebody like, like Jordan Belfort, uh, but whatever. So um, <laughs> why, is, why, why is that a lazy question? Yeah, I, I think it's a lazy question because it's so, so deeply rooted in like old fashioned sales culture, right? It is so deeply rooted in the, the bullpen culture where it's only men selling and like women in tight skirts getting them their coffee. It's deeply rooted in a, a culture um, and everybody saw it in the movie of, of romanticizing, scamming your clients, lying to get a deal done, uh, treating your customers like they're, they're dupes. And there are so many ways, Jason, and, and you as an HR expert know this, there's so many ways that if we're, we're trying to make a great hire, we can uncover something like your sales philosophy or how you would approach a selling situation that there, there's just no excuse to use a, a question so tied to, to misogyny and tied to lying and manipulating and cheating and somebody who was a, is a convicted criminal. Yeah, I can't forget that point. <laughs> so it's it was I mean it was interesting. I was I was a bit confused by how he found me as like a small creator. I 
at the time, I think I had like 10,000 followers. He has over a million and a half. Uh, I was confused by why it upset him so much that he felt the need to not just stitch my video on the TikTok platform, but like download it, edit it offline, and then re-upload it, covering my handle and not tagging me in it. Um, and I was confused by how many people came to his defense um, in a way that um, really highlighted a lot of sexism. So let's talk about toxic sales for a minute. How do you handle the situation? Suppose you have 10 salespeople. One of them is a toxic person. No one likes them. Like he upsets everyone, but he brings in like, we'll say 9% of the sales. The other nine combined, like only bringing 10%. Like yeah. how do you like, I mean, I, I mean, some people will say get rid of the toxic person, but then you lose all that revenue. And some people say, well, you get rid of the toxic salesperson, other people step up, but will they yeah. really step up? They haven't stepped up yet. Right. Like how would you handle that situation? Well, if, 90% of your team is bringing in 10% of your revenue, you might need to rehaul the whole, the whole team. Um, it might say something about, about you as a, as a manager and a, a leader, you have to get rid of them. And that doesn't mean like fire them on the spot. I think first have a conversation with them about their behaviors. I've often found in managing toxic personalities that they don't realize they're toxic. Like I'm, I'm thinking of a, a top performer uh, that I, I managed ages ago and she had, she, she was young and, and um, had a family life where both her, her mother and her father were very verbally abusive to her. And so she brought a lot of that to work and would verbally abuse others. And she, like she just did not understand how significant the impact was and that that type of behavior in a workplace could cost her her job. So I think first like have a conversation and see if, if that, that, that toxic behavior and how it's coming out is something that can be maybe managed or trained around or coached around, or if they're just kind of a, kind of a jerk. Um, and at the end of the day, if you decide they are a jerk, you, you have to fire them. You cannot keep somebody like that on your team. Um, maybe the team you have in place that day isn't going to be who steps up, but you're never going to find your next top salesperson if they walk in to the sales floor, walk into the sales team, and that's your top performer. And they know that that's the type of culture and behavior that you're okay with. Yeah, you're right. It's, it's, it's so many things to be fixed. That's a simple conversation, right? Because it's amazing so many times someone will say, you know, Jason Cabin is a performer, right? He's not kind of right. He's doing this wrong. Well, have you told him? Well, no. Why am I telling him? He knows what he's doing wrong. Hmm. Well, if I know what I'm doing wrong, why do I, why do I continuously do it wrong over and over again, right? Am I just that mess of a person? I, I'm doing wrong all the time. Like, maybe I don't know what I'm doing wrong, right? I think so many people miss that point. Yeah, I think you're, you're exactly right. And most people I found, even when you're tackling very sensitive subjects like lack of performance or like toxic behavior are, are receptive. More, more people than not are receptive and want to change and, and want to grow and, and do better and be better. So Les, you talked about this a little, earlier, a little, a little bit earlier, but how are you making sales more inclusive? Yeah, so a, a couple of ways. Uh, certainly just through putting the message out there um, on, you know, on LinkedIn and, and on TikTok, um, sharing my own story of what it was like, what it is like to be a woman in sales and letting people know that they are not alone. Uh, and often, Jason, uh, you know, I, I think it's particularly when I speak to women in sales, letting them know that it's not a reflection on them when they're excluded from like all the boys going out to lunch um, on the company and they didn't get invited or uh, not getting that promotion and somebody that's less qualified, like just making sure that they understand that it's not them and they, they shouldn't let it manifest an imposter syndrome and they shouldn't let it impact their confidence and, um, you know, hopefully providing some encouragement, but also providing specific techniques and tools that can help them um, kind of stake their, their claim and, and, um, and get ahead. So yeah, a lot of it is, is encouraging people, sharing my story, 
um, connecting with our next generation of sales professionals and encouraging them to, to consider the profession, um, sharing resources to, to help. Um, and whenever I'm invited to, um, I always spend time like moderating panels at like every year at the tech inclusion conference or like women in SAS sales. So whenever there's an opportunity for me to give my time um, to, to other organizations to, to amplify those voices, I certainly do that as well. So now of course diversity includes all this in a big deal right now. And it's been like, it's been a big deal for a few years, but, and you might not know the answer to this, but based on numbers, nothing's getting better, right? Like, do you go back? I got, I got a VAR tech maybe starting in 2015. All the numbers are pretty much the same, right? Despite the focus on emphasis, the numbers across the board are pretty much the same. Is, is something that yeah. people are doing wrong? Is like this, is this going to take longer? Or what do you think? Um, I'd like to, to say that n nobody's necessarily, uh, well, no, that's not fair. People are doing something wrong uh, because we're, the, the numbers should be growing more than they are. And, and they're growing, but they're sort of eking along. And then, you know, the, the numbers for women in sales were doing pretty good. And then with the pandemic, we had, um, I don't know what the most recent number is, but, you know, like 40% of women dropped out of the, the workforce. Um, so if we, if we look at sales, depending on whose numbers you look at, um, about 30% of sales professionals are women. When you get into B2B, the number's lower. When you get to B2B tech, the number's even lower. When you get into leadership, now you're closer to 15%. Um, those numbers are, are similar if you're looking at, at the BIPOC population. Like it's, it, sales still remains like a cisgender white man game. I would say what people are doing right is talking about it and just acknowledging that. Um, I'd say what people are doing right is folks like Andy Paul who, who you know sort of fits fits that uh, that that persona um, is making it their personal mission to amplify um, voices that are different. I think there are some amazing companies out, out there like right away Drift and Gong come to mind who are putting budgets and resources behind uh, more uh, inclusive inclusive hiring and inclusive teams. What I don't see, Jason, is the follow through. So, and, and I'd love to hear your opinion on this because you see, you know, people talk a big game, we're gonna be more diverse and like it's pride month, here's our pride banner on our logo. And it's, it's a lot of like, like outward facing stuff. And then they might hire three new women on their team and then they manage those women like they're men. They train those women on the same talk tracks and the, the same sales style that was created by you know, a white man 40 years ago. And, and there's no, very few organizations have specific support networks for veterans, for minorities, for women that actually once they're in role, support their continued success. And I think that that piece is still missing from almost all organizations. Yeah, I, I, I agree with you. That's, that's a good point. Um, so to go back to sales for a minute, and this is another one of, your, one of your great posts. You post that a lot of salespeople don't ask for the clothes. And I think it's in general, right? Black people don't ask for the clothes. Is this there? I guess it goes back to again, like people are scared to hear no, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, so it was either Salesforce or HubSpot that I picked that that stat up on. And I was surprised, like, not that I, I don't through working with my own sales teams and, and through sales team builder and building the custom playbooks, understand that asking for the business is, is still hard for people, but 67%, I think was the stat 67% of people don't ask for, for the deal. And I mean, it was like a jaw dropping um, stat for me. That's that very 67, surprising. Yeah, sixty-seven percent of of people. Um, so, I think yeah, part of it is that they they are afraid to hear no, which is too bad because all they're doing is wasting their time 
when they could have either gotten a no and realized that it was a no and they shouldn't continue to follow up and they can can pivot and focus their, their time and energy and effort elsewhere, or it's a no, but below that sat an objection, which is a, a, a challenge that they could have partnered with their buyer to overcome in the moment, but because they didn't take the time to, to you know, pull it out and have that conversation, the buyer loses steam or finds another partner that cares more uh, about understanding their unique needs and, and challenges. Um, and it's, it's an opportunity to give your buyer an out because like, bu buyers also have a hard time saying no. They don't, they don't wanna hurt our feelings, right? Um, and so it's an important time to, to say, is this something that you want to move forward with? Or based on our conversation, it sounds like we should put next steps into place. And, uh, you know, I, I think for salespeople, like be selfish in asking that question because it's going to protect your time and help you close more sales. Um, and also make sure that you're being considerate of your buyer and giving them a, a chance to tell you no. So Leslie, let's talk about another dynamic that I think is going on now or we're going to probably go on pretty soon. With COVID, not pretty much you know, dropping down, people getting vaccinated. Already your companies are saying, hey, employees, come back to office. I think employees are going to say, hey, wait, everyone, wait a minute, Mr. or Mr. Manager. I've proven the last year that I can produce, I'll produce what I ever did in the office, right? I've proven that time and time and down, my production levels way up, all the kind of stuff. So now you want me to like drive these 20,000 hours every year to the office, stay in, stay in this you know, cubicle, and, you know, and the stats prove that, you know, you probably only work maybe 10 feet hours in the office, right? The rest of the time you're on Facebook or gossiping, right? Just so you can like, you know, be over me these 40 hours. I yeah. And plus for like the people, all, all these openings going up, I just think it's an interesting dynamic, how that plays out. Oh, it's going to be such an interesting dynamic. I mean, I think the 40 hour work week is a sham. Um, it just, for the, the types of, of jobs we have now, uh, and, and certainly that doesn't mean that there aren't jobs that need the 40 hour work week, but for most people, uh, they, they don't need a 40 hour work week. And, and I, you know, sort of mentioned this earlier that I'm kind of over the concept of like being paid for the hours of my day, like pay me to get a job done, pay me for my intellectual property. Don't, don't chain me to a desk for 40 hours a day. So I think the 40 hour work week is a sham. I have been uh, fully remote for three years and then I was um, partially remote. I had, I mean, I set my own schedule, uh, but I would, I would work from home on days when I felt like working from home. So like a true flex environment for two years before that. Um, I'm not going back to the office. Uh, and I think so many over this past year found what I found, um, which is the the freedom to create a better work-life balance. Um, but there are, there is this legacy of bosses, I guess for lack of a better, better word, bosses that are just so attached to keeping us under their thumb, to, to being in control. There is still a real lack of trust of employees and, one thing I asked for for many years, Jason, is like, if you don't trust somebody, why did you hire them in the first yeah, place? Yeah, your hiring process is messed up. Yeah. This did, is you, your hiring process. Uh, did you see that, that Tim Cook, the CEO of Apple, made the announcement that he wants all staff back uh, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and then called it flex time and the I employees are... I think it was just yesterday, I think that it came out, but the employees are furious because they're like, that's not flex time. That yeah. That's a, a hybrid schedule, but it's not flexible. Yeah. flexible Amazon with, did the same thing yeah. about a month ago. I mean, it's not this email out and it got leaked, of course, you know, telling Amazon people, hey, we're not saying this is happening soon, but just be prepared. Like mm -hmm. the old ways coming back. So I, I don't know. I think th th those big leaders, the, the Amazons, the Apples will, will set the conversation in two ways. I think one being that they have said, we're not going to bring you back into the office Monday to Friday, nine to five. So it's going to be hard for any organization to then do that and still get top talent. 
So I, I think at the very least, it, it does open up some flexibility for a hybrid work environment. Um, but for those organizations that were maybe toying with the idea of instilling more trust and, and flexibility um, and, and the privilege of, of balance to their employees, they might now be thinking, well, maybe we can be a bit more, we can put some more rigor around our, our schedule of having people in office. So I am also very curious to see how it works out, but I will not be joining everybody as they go back to office. Yeah. I'm the same way. Like, like me, like, uh, so I'm kind of a hybrid. I'm kind of, I'm kind of crazy how I do it. Like, so like I can never see like going to office 40 hours a week, being the same thing over again. However, I can't work from home. Right. And when I work from home, like, Every time I get up, I'm making a full meal, you know, or I'll, I'll watch TV for 30 minutes. Next thing I know, I've been watching some kind of Netflix movie or two in the afternoon, the bed says, Hey, Jason, just lay down for 30 minutes. Next thing you know, I flip from two to six, right? So I'm not, I'm not a good work from home person, right? Of course, the wife wants something, the kids want something, you know, or just, this, 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 too many distractions, right? So I have to go somewhere to work, but I don't necessarily want to go to work at the same place all the time, right? I, like it. I have a yeah. boss, that's big, you know? you're like my husband. He needs to leave the house. I have to leave, yeah. And and go somewhere. If I don't leave, uh, I have my pajamas on like the three straight days. Oh, that's so funny. And I'm the the total opposite. Like I I love staying home. I do not feel the need to leave. I don't get stir crazy. I get too focused because I don't have external cues around me. Like, oh, it's 5 p.m. I can tell because everybody else is getting up and leaving. And like my husband will, will you know, go out and, and work at a WeWork or be in the office and he'll come home and it's 6.30 and I'm still working and he opens the door and says, well, like, what the heck are you still doing? I'm like, oh, what time is it? Um, I also often forget to feed myself until very late in the afternoon for the same thing. I'm like, oh God. Yeah, I'm the opposite. I'm like, I feed headache. myself too much at home. <laughs> no, I'm the opposite. But so it was something that we were talking about before we went live um, was the Myers-Briggs. Yeah personality test. And I, I think it's, it's so interesting. So you're an I and I'm an E, you're an introvert and I'm an, I an extrovert. And people are like, you're an extrovert, but you just like being at home alone all day long and not talking to anybody. And I'm like, right. Because it gives me the opportunity to, to recharge or to stay charged. Mm -hmm. And when I have conversations with people, whether it's it's clients, friends, families, colleagues, being at home and 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 being more deliberate in when I choose to have those conversations allows me to show up and be fully present and bring all of my energy and all of my passion to those conversations. So it's it's interesting how like it works differently for you versus me versus my husband versus uh, obviously tons of our, our listeners probably are somewhere in between as well. Yeah. And people tell me, you're not a, you're not an introvert. You have a podcast. I said, exactly. <laughs> exactly. I have a podcast. I can control it. Right. It's, it's a hybrid. And even like on the Myers Briggs, I was 51% extrovert and 49% introvert. Yeah. So I'm and, like, and, okay. And, and, yeah. So one question differently, he maybe felt differently the next day. Yeah, it's... <laughs> right. Or you would have caught me in a different mood or. <laughs> yeah. And one reason I, I say, I, I, so I'm INFJ. But what I like to say, because according to all the stats, it was like only 1% of the war. So I kind of say, hey, I'm kind of different, right? I think definitely do things differently, right? So that's the thing I do with that. But yeah, it's, yeah. You, you asked me the question probably today, I'll probably be something totally different. Although I I'm pretty sure that. I'll still be an I across the board regardless. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. The, the one that we did have the, the same was the J, like the deliberate decision making and organization. I was like, okay. I can totally see that. And the, the prep for our conversation today, which I loved, it was very detailed yeah. and I went into it really knowing exactly what, what to be prepared for. So Leslie, you have a lot going on, right? Your business, your side hustles, TikTok, your volunteer work. How do you do all this? Like, how do you, like you have a, like a, some kind of scheduling tool, you like, you get up every day and just wing it and pray for the best. Or like, how do you pull us together? Like drive yourself batshit crazy. I think more of the, the latter, which is probably not what people want to hear. Um, no, there isn't like a method to my madness. I would say I try to listen to my instincts and my gut a lot. And what I mean by that, Jason, is that there are days where I wake up and I am jazzed. I am ready for the day. I'm going to make those cold calls. I'm going to 
batch create two hours of content. I'm going to reply to all these emails and I am, I'm, I'm there mentally, mentally, physically, emotionally, like I am leaned into that day. Um, and so I, I acknowledge that energy and that mindset and I really take advantage and have a full and productive day. But the next day I might wake up and I just might not, not be feeling it. My energy might be a little bit low or maybe I'm just feeling a bit emotionally drained. I'll work a six hour day. Maybe get on my soul cycle bike instead, take a bath and read my book. So when I'm ready to work, I lean into that. I don't stop myself at my eight hour day. I work a 12, 13 hour day. When I'm, I'm not um, emotionally, mentally, physically ready to, to work, I give myself just the permission to, to go a bit slower. Uh, so I say no a lot. And for anybody that's ever reached out to me for like a coffee connect, they'll, they'll find that familiar where I'm like, sorry, like my next availability for a coffee connect is in nine weeks. Um, because I only put two on my calendar every week to make sure I'm not like over allocating time to that particular thing. Um, and I ask people for agendas before I get on calls with them. So I, I know that there's going to be a mutual value. And if they don't want to send me an agenda, then I don't want to put it in my calendar. So I, I'm hugely protective of my time. I say a no a lot, um, which was a, a learned and taught skill. And I really just try to, to like listen to my body and listen to my mind and, and lean in when um, I'm, I'm feeling jazz, but also give myself some like grace to take it slow when I'm not. Yeah, so one thing I've done a better job of usually saying no to people, right? And that's so important. Another thing I do too, uh, I, I instead of like doing hour meeting, all my meetings are 15 minutes, right? And then after that, do some follow-up, right? Um, that's such a good... Yeah. Oh, talk, about how you, talk about how you learned how to say no. I think that's a learned learn process. Oh, Everyone wants to please people. We want to say yes. This might be the opportunity I need coming up. You never know who they know. Yeah. Blah, 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 blah. How do you like start yourself to start saying no? I'm still learning it. One thing that I will mention, um, because I, I did a TikTok about this and the amount of people that were like, what this function exists, is that in Outlook, you have a setting where your meetings will end five minutes uh, early if they're 30 minute meetings or 10 minutes early if they're 50 minute meetings. So for everybody out there looking for like an actionable, I can do this today to have better time management, go change that setting on your Outlook calendar. <laughs> uh, so that's a really great tip, Jason. Um, so I, I feel like I'm still learning how to say no, right? Like there are still times where I say yes. And immediately afterwards, I think, well, really, really should not have committed to that. Uh, so I do a couple of things. One is that I, I take a tremendous amount of pride in doing what I say I'm going to do and delivering and showing up. So I, I try to keep that in mind when I say yes and only say yes to things that I, I feel like I can fully show up for and fully commit to. So I think just like putting it back on me, like, are you saying yes just to make yourself feel better? Or are you saying yes because you really feel like it's the right thing for the person that's asking you? And I would say the other thing is I, I've just tried to be a lot more transparent. Like, sorry, that's not something I'm making time for right now. Sorry, like that doesn't align with my key result area that I'm focused on right now. And, and being like, it's, it's not you, like I don't, it's not that I don't want to talk to you, just having a conversation with you right now or working on this project with you right now is not 100% aligned with like my personal and professional deliverables. So it's going to be a no. So let's like, if you're an HR person, you got to do HR training, like HR certifications. If you're a software developer, you got to get, you know, learn skills all over and over again. Is there some kind of training salespeople ever do? Like, does someone got to, you know, kind of a, like accounting degree for salespeople or anything like that? Or is it nope. like, just got to like learn it? No certification at all, um, which is such a travesty. Because I mean, like if, if you're in HR, if you're in tax, if you're in legal, like all of these professions have their their CPEs, their, their you know, professional credits that, that you have to have and have to maintain. Um uh, you know, it's, it sort of harkens back to one of your earlier questions, Jason, about why are there no institutions offering degrees in sales? And it's because people don't take sales seriously. They view sales as a job. They don't view sales as a profession. And 
people are so quick to, to talk smack about salespeople and put down salespeople and share their horror story with a salesperson they interacted with 27 years ago. Um, but, you know, very, very few people are like asking, how can we make sales better? How, you know, how can I interact with you in a different way that would, you know, would, would help you? So there are a lot of certifications out there and, I think, frankly, more salespeople need to take it upon themselves to get certified, even though it's not required. I've done some great certifications on Coursera, on edX, HubSpot has a whole HubSpot Academy that is free to use, and they have incredible trainings. I've done like Udemy, Allison. Uh, I've done a, I've done a ton of them. Um, and a lot of them are free. Some of them will offer you a chance to buy a certification if you're looking to like build your resume and credentials for 49 bucks. So, you know, pretty like low point of entry. Um, so no, unfortunately credits aren't required, but there are a lot of opportunities for salespeople to still become accredited and not that many salespeople take the, the sort of ownership of, of doing that. Um, and I, you know, I think it goes back to viewing sales as their job, not their profession and saying, Hey, what are you in? And they say finance, not I sell for a finance company. Well, Leslie, this next question I'm going to ask you, I think you know the answer. Yes. <laughs> Do you consider yourself a content creator? No, no, I'm just kidding. Yes, no. definitely. <laughs> Yeah, definitely. I have been a massive advocate of, of social selling, like since it was called, like before it was called social selling. Um, and that has evolved into content creation and into content marketing. And I don't do content marketing for my full-time job, but certainly content marketing, uh, like to the content marketers out there, I will say like rudimentary content marketing um, for my professional brand and certainly for, for my business. Uh, but it's, it's the future of sales. Like organizations and individuals need to get hit to social selling and, and creating uh, content that shares something, you know, inspiring or educational or entertaining with their, their audience. And your two big platforms, your two big platforms on LinkedIn and TikTok, correct? Yep, exactly. So I think everyone will know why you're on LinkedIn. Explain what drew you to TikTok. Cause like I'm on TikTok too. And don't be wrong, there's like trash on there, but there's so much good content there. Like there's you, one guy I follow, he's like maybe 80 years old. He's a psychiatrist. He gives like psychiatry chips and like um, does a little salsa dance. It is a tip in like English and Spanish. I mean, there's so many, such many good stuff. And I think like any other social media platform, you gotta know, know get through the trash, so, so to speak, right? Mm -hmm. What what drew you to TikTok? So what drew me to TikTok is what I was seeing on my LinkedIn news feed, the types of posts that inspired that series of like dramatic readings of LinkedIn posts. And it was a lot of advice from this from people that all looked the same and all sounded the same. And I thought maybe this isn't the best platform for my, my message. Like why, why am I spending so much time and energy trying to, to break through the monotony of these messages when clearly that's what the folks on this platform want. That's what they're celebrating. That's what they're responding to. And when I think more deeply about what I want my legacy to be, and it, it is that legacy of, of making sales into a more inclusive, inclusive, more respected profession. I need to be communicating not with like my peers, other 30 somethings or, or folks that have been in sales for even longer. I need to communicate with a younger audience. So I, I, you know, I looked at the doing Facebook and Instagram and all the other platforms and TikTok really felt like the right place to me with their primary base, 65% of their users being between 18 and, and 24. Um, and it's been an, an incredible place to create a community. I, I, I bring a much different version of myself, a much more, I think, authentic and original version of myself to TikTok, which makes it fun. And um, I think 
allows me to connect with people in a much deeper, much more meaningful way than I ever could on LinkedIn. And, and how often do you post on TikTok like every day? At, at least once a day, every single day, usually two or three times. Yeah, like I, you have a great, I think you have a great channel. But every time I look at it, I get mad at myself, right? Jason, what are you doing? Like, you, you copy her, you know, you know, she's doing it the right way. I just like, ah, oh, yeah, I gotta, I gotta get better at TikTok, no doubt. It's, you know, I'll tell everybody my, my trick. Um, it's that I batch create content um, and like a crazy person, I'll bring in a couple of different tops and like hang them on the handle of my soul cycle bike over there and I'll change a couple of times. So it, it, you know, it looks fresh visually. So people aren't like, oh, it's the same video over and over again. But on those days where I wake up and I am just emotionally full and energetic, I will sit down and I will, I will batch create three or four hours of content in one day. And then I'll be able to use that for, for two or three weeks. So that's what allows me to post so frequently and without so getting burned out. organization skills come into play, right? <laughs> yeah, that J, absolutely, absolutely. Because most people, even they did like do batch at like four hours, I'm like, man, I'm too lazy to change shirts every video. I'm like, I'm not doing that. I'll just do like four hours of video with the same shirt. <laughs> I do. I do some outfit changes. It makes me feel so nerdy, but I'm like, well, whatever. It's what it's what works for me. And obviously it also works for, for my audience. But something else you said that I thought was was interesting, Jason, was like kind of cutting through the the trash, the garbage, whatever on, on LinkedIn or not on LinkedIn, on TikTok. Um, and something that people rarely realize about TikTok if they're not on it is that it is so much bigger than just a bunch of kids doing like cute dances. People make a lots of money on that. Yeah. It's that like, that's what I, before I was on the platform, that's what I thought it was exclusively. And the, the TikTok algorithm is so smart, scary, smart. That's a whole nother topic. Um, and you can quickly teach it what type of content you want. So now I'm getting a ton of, of professional content. So people talking about HR and recruitment and psychology and corporate life and, and sales, unfortunately, not that many B2B sales people come join me um, and, and marketing and social selling and, and all of that. And then like a huge dose of videos of raccoons, goats, and dogs, because I just, I love those. Um, but there's, there's a community on TikTok for every single one of your listeners. Every single person listening right now ha can find their own community on, on TikTok. And if you're thinking about joining Jason and, and I, um, do it, like take that action, do it today, start creating content. It doesn't have to be perfect, just like cold calling, right? Like it doesn't have to be perfect. Put some content out there, acknowledge that it's probably going to be kind of crappy and a bit cringeworthy at first and that you'll grow and you'll evolve as a content creator and it'll get better and you'll, you'll find your followers, you'll find your, your fans. But like step one is, is just get out there and take action. You know, TikTok, you never know what's going to blow up. Two examples, two people I follow. One, I think it is Bella Port. She got on TikTok like in April. It come like some kind of video got like millions of views. Last week, she read us a, a, a song, got a hundred million views on YouTube, right? Yeah, and she wasn't even on the platform back in April, right? And another person I follow, I don't know her name, but she goes by Zoe Fish. She does these like cute dances. She mm -hmm. just got signed as a model for I think um for selling clothes, for, like think like Nordstrom, like higher end stuff, right? Yeah. All from TikTok, right? And people don't realize like how much stuff is out there you can take advantage of, no and matter you, what your career field is. Right, and you like you don't know what's gonna resonate with people. Like Bella's a perfect example that all of her original videos were just her doing like cute faces yeah. like she, she can contort her face in a way that it's confusing to me she would be good uh on like that bewitched like the woman that could just, yeah. Like, yeah exactly yeah, that's your, yeah. <laughs> um but who would have ever thought that that type of content would speak to people in a way that would would i mean she has something crazy like 40 million followers yeah. now and signed yeah. a record deal and released a music video and uh the, the opportunity to go viral on TikTok only exists on TikTok. There's no other platform. No, you're not going viral on Facebook mm -hmm. or LinkedIn or Instagram. Uh, definitely anymore. not. No, it's, it, ha it has an opportunity for virality that, that you can't find anywhere else. Um, and another perfect example, remember um, earlier this year, I uh, can't think of his name. I think it's Dogface420 on TikTok. He did the video with the, with the cranberry thing. With Fleetwood Mac. Yeah, it's like, like, I, I, you're like, he, it like, he just blew up out of nowhere right now. He had like all this stuff kept in his life, right? 
and you just never know what's going to hit or not hit, right? You got to put it out there. Yeah. Ocean Spray bought him a brand new truck and like fully paid it off. And it was funny. Um, he was like, he so thought he could he, drive he, to work. Yeah. He thought it was just though. He was getting the Ocean Spray. He didn't realize the truck was for him, right? Like, no, dude, the truck's for you too. You know, it's, and, it's and, fun. And he, and he found like a, a contract that sells like lawn boards from some company. It's like, I mean, you never know, right? It's, you never know. So take action. So talk more about how branding yourself is important these days. Like you have to put yourself out there, right? You can't be scared, so to speak. I mean, what, what's a, I think maybe it's Gary Vee's smart because like, you know, even the worst content is better than no content, you know, think about the points of you no know, getting over that hump and putting yourself out there. Yeah. So I, I think one of the reasons I'm so passionate about building my professional brand is because I did it wrong for so many years. I got on LinkedIn in 2007, which I, I guess I'm kind of aging myself, but it was a, it was a brand new platform. And earlier I gave the advice, like, don't use LinkedIn as a sales platform, use it as a networking platform. Guess what I did in 2007? Used it as a sales platform exclusively. Posted no content, only connected with people when I thought they were like leads, um, just didn't engage in, in any meaningful way. Um, and when I wanted to leave that job, it was super, super tough because I hadn't built any meaningful connections outside of my company. I didn't have a professional brand. All I had was just some black and white bullet points on a resume and the, the first time I tried to leave that company, um, I still have it. I was uh, like in the closet uh, thinking about some, like a, a TikTok series I'm going to make because I, here's back to the organization, back to, to my J on my Myers-Briggs. I had a legal pad where I wrote down every single job I applied for and, you know, the company name and who I applied with and what the job title was. And it was 114 jobs the first time I tried to leave that company and I never got a job. Nobody knew me, no connections, nobody to like leverage. Can you introduce me to somebody? Uh, and that was the moment that it clicked that I was like, my LinkedIn profile is not my company profile. It's not a place for me to only have my job title that I do at my current company and that company's you know background image and repost the stuff that the company posts. And that's how I was using it. And I, I know that that's how most people are using their accounts and so wrong. Your LinkedIn profile and your professional brand need to, to be something that can follow you from company to company. Like that should be consistent. That should, should not be um, attached to or like an indicative of, of where you work at a particular time. Um, and and that's going to be what helps you build more meaningful connections, get your next, next job, you know, connect with prospects or, or peers in, um, in a deeper way. So I spent like three years building my professional brand before, like I did a blog, I spent a lot of time building up my LinkedIn, connecting with people, uh, did some like podcasts and some other stuff. So it's three years I spent building my brand before I uh, started looking for jobs again and then got headhunted for the next job, got headhunted for the next job, got headhunted for the next job, getting headhunted right now. So, you know, get, get out there and build your personal brand because that's like, that is this yours and you need to be able to, to leverage it um, throughout your entire career, regardless of what company you're at. Leslie, do you do anything on Clubhouse? No, I tried Clubhouse multiple times, Jason, and I repeatedly hated it and had bad experiences. So I stopped, but I will tell you that the sell me the pen question that became the video that blew up and blah, blah, that came from Clubhouse. I was on a Clubhouse and one of the speakers was like, oh, this is, this is the question. And all of the rest of the, the, the panelists were like, oh yeah, great. And you saw people raising their hand to go up to be like, yeah, I use this and it's the best question ever. And it's like, so shocked me that I went and then made a TikTok about it. <laughs> so I do have Clubhouse to thank for, for that. But um, no, unfortunately it just, I found that it was not the right channel for me. Yeah, I know it was pretty popular before. It's like, it's kind of dying down a little bit. And, and one thing, like I, I have some good experiences, like it's like 
it's like sometimes the rooms will get too big, right? Like, and, and, and it's obviously it's like someone trying to sell coaching you know, or trying to sell affiliate marketing, you know, or something that's crazy, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't, I haven't have figured out Clubhouse. The one thing I'm trying to do, I'm going to try to start like a Clubhouse, like Clubhouse Club for my podcast. Like, like people like start rooms in there. Like, like you start a room in there, like doing sales stuff. But I don't know yet. It's, it's, but then again, like, you know, do you really need another time suck, so to speak, you know? Yeah. I think that that was it for me that I knew I didn't want to start hosting my own rooms because I, I decided what my channels were and that's what I have time for is TikTok and LinkedIn. I do not have time to build another channel and I would sit in on other people's rooms and I found that there was a lot of bullying going on in, like I said, in a lot of like startup rooms and sales rooms. And there was a lot, especially in the startup rooms, a lot of bullying going on, which is, that's a no for me. Um, and then a lot of rooms where people would get up and then just try to sell their own thing, which like, I, I didn't come here to listen to your like crappy sales pitch on why I should buy your personal coaching. Uh, definitely a lot of that going on in there. Yeah. Which is just a no for me. And then I would say the other third of the rooms were exceptional and, and great and great conversations, yeah. but like, I, I just don't have time for something when oh, you're like, man, this person, or oh, you're like, man, this person's been talking for 25,000 minutes. <laughs> Will the moderator please cut them off? Like, come on. Yes, now. yes, it's so true. It's so true. So, can you talk in more detail about Sales Team Builder LLC? Yeah. So, it's my company. I started a company, um, which is super exciting. I started um, Sales Team Builder back in 2018 as part of my journey of figuring out sort of what I wanted my brand to be and, and what I wanted to do next. Uh, it's evolved since I, I started it into really focusing on the creation of like custom collateral and custom playbooks for small sales teams. I think we kind of focus on similar size companies like that, you know, 50 person, 49 person or, or um, smaller for me, sales team, I guess for, for um, you, that's kind of your, your niche for company, but it's supporting those small sales teams that need to develop much more robust processes but want to do it in a way where it's not like, here's your script, go to phone, read script. Um, so um, teams that want to empower their reps to, to figure out what works best for them, but still keep it in the, those kind of best class, um, best in class parameters. So it's, it's been incredible. And, uh, you know, I, I get really good feedback. So I know that the sales playbooks that I'm delivering are good, but I also, benefit it from it so much myself because it, it becomes this thought exercise where I'm thinking through how do these like sales fundamentals shift or how do these conversations shift when I'm building a sales playbook for a SaaS company versus a, a digital marketing agency versus the last one I delivered was for a fertilizer company. So it's, it's also this I think really amazing exercise in challenging myself to, to, to see which of those sales fundamentals are transferable versus which really need to, to be much more unique to that product or, or that vertical or ICP, whatever it is. Um, so it's great. It's really fun work. It's really challenging work. It is the work I do on Saturdays. So what's your vision of the company? Is your vision like become the number one sales training company in the United States? No, it is not. It is not. I, I don't know. I, I think I'm still on that journey. I, I really toyed um, at the beginning of 2020, like before the pandemic started with making sales team builder my full-time gig. And I realized that I just didn't want to. It's I, like, I like having it as a side business. I like the privilege of being able to be hugely selective in who I work with because I, I, I get to take clients. I don't have to take clients to pay my bills. And I like being a part of a company. I, I, like, I like having colleagues and teamwork and all, you know, enter whatever buzzwords you, you want. Um, I like health insurance, which, which is important. Oh man, that's um, good, good one. So I, I realized that it wasn't what I wanted to do next. I do want to stay in that, that kind of like corporate um, environment for, for a while longer. Um, but ultimately, 
I would like to be known as like the preeminent stop to get a custom sales playbook created for your small and growing sales team. What would have to happen or like how many sales you have to get or what metrics you have to, would have to meet for you to say, okay, I, I have no choice but to stop corporate and go in this full time. Like I have to go all in now. What would have to happen? Wow. Like, okay, I, I can't I ignore this anymore. These numbers are too crazy. Yeah, I don't know. I actually don't know, Jason, if it's an, a number, like a, a financial sales number that would would cause me to make that switch. I, th I think it would be more like it, it feels right. I now am at this at the point in my career where this feels intuitively like the best next step and then match that sort of knowledge of self and, and what I know is going to make me happy and fulfill with mapping out the financials and making sure those those were feasible but I, I feel like it will be right when I'm at the point of career, my career where I know that that's the, that's the thing that I want to do next that I'm going to wake up every single morning jazz to do full time and it's not today and I don't think it'll be tomorrow but it, it will be um, and, and I'm giving myself, I think a lot of latitude, like I'm not putting pressure on myself that I have to launch my business by this time next year or before I'm 40 or, you know, whatever the, the kind of made up timelines are. Um, yeah, and, I, and, I don't know. And, that was kind and, of a wishy-washy answer. And, and it has to be able to pay for your health insurance regardless. <laughs> and of it will have to be able to pay for my health. I love health insurance. Yes. <laughs> so, um, Leslie, what's, what do you focus on right now? Like in life in general? Yeah, in general, yeah. What am I focusing on? So I'm writing a book. Why well, am I not surprised? <laughs> Just like add one more thing to my list. So like have you have, have you seen the memes? I have no more time to do anything. I'm I'm strapped out. Ooh, another project. Let me take it over. I know, I know. Um I'm writing a book that has been just a really incredible process because I'm also doing it in a way where I'm not putting like a specific deadline on myself or specific, specific parameters about what it has to be. And instead it sort of manifested as this opportunity to like journal and reflect. And that's been extremely powerful in like codifying who I am and what I want my legacy to be and where I, I want to be spending my time, where I should be spending my time. So that, that's a really fun um, project that has been keeping me busy. I am fully vaccinated. So I have a lot of plans to go see friends and family um, over the Memorial Day weekend and then the week before that had uh, an opportunity to go meet my 11 month old niece who I had not yet met uh, and then flew from that set of family to another set of family and um, got to see my brother and his wife and their two and a half year old and then brand new two month old. So it's like that has has really filled me to the brim. Um, just having a chance to reconnect in person with loved ones. So uh, honestly, I think that's what I'm going to try to stay busy with is just reconnecting with people. I booked two months back in Montana um, because I, I, I did three months last year, which was a, a, an incredible blessing to get out of my like 25th floor small condo uh, in downtown Chicago and out in, into Montana. And I, I think as much as we want to believe that we have undergone this, you know, huge shift and somehow we're all going to be better people and put less on our calendars and have a better work-life balance. I'm not totally bought into the reality of that. I think by this time next year, it'll probably be kind of back to business as usual. So um, taking two months to, to go work remotely in my childhood home uh, in, in Montana. So like journaling, reflecting and reconnecting. So talking about being better people, right? So a lot of people disagree with this, right? But 
during COVID, I probably traveled away too much, right? Like, but on the plane, like I never seen planes so clean. No one's on them, no lounge, right? So I probably traveled too much, right? I, I took a trip somewhere like a, a, a couple of weeks ago. People coming back, I'm like, man, people do suck, right? Because they're, they're coming, they're coming back, right? They're rude. They're like, it's just ridiculous, right? Like, I'm like, man. I mean, not saying things go about COVID, but man, that like, like empty flights, you know, no lines. It's, 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 like, it was, it was great, right? Now it's getting back to pre-COVID. All the people's personalities yeah. and being rude is coming back too. It's like, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I feel like everybody should live by and embrace the life motto of don't be a jerk. Like just, just try to try to embrace that every day. Just don't be a jerk. Um, and yet, particularly in airports, you see how hard that can be for people. Yeah, you want to always see you want to see the worst end of, of the human race. Go to airport, <laughs> go to any airport in the world, and it will oh. see it. It's too bad. I have a real soft spot for, for airports. It's it's because I, I traveled um, prior to the pandemic. Well, I mean, really in a few roles before that I've had like a 60, 40 inside outside split. Like I, I love the ritual of airports and like going to sit in the lounge and having my drink and getting my, you know, like particular sandwich that um, that I have. So I, I miss it and I'm, I'm happy to be back despite the <laughs> jerks. <laughs> yeah. So Leslie, um, I think most people know what HubSpot and Salesforce is. Yeah. Is there anything else that that's just as good or better or is that pretty much the two standard barriers, so to speak? Um, I am obsessed with sales hacker. Sales hacker. Yes. I'm obsessed with them. Um, I've never met any of them in person. They probably are like weary of me by this point because I talk about them so much and post about them so much but the the website is great it's free they have a blog they have a jobs board you can post your questions and members from the community answer your questions it's just it's it's incredible um, that's my favorite sales community there are two others one called rev genius and one called modern sales pros that I'm also a, a member of um, and I think they are also very helpful. Rev Genius has a very good jobs board if, if that's up your alley. Um, in Modern Sales Pros, you can get um, like almost real-time replies to your questions from other peers. So those are exceptional resources. Um, I, like there's two blogs that I really love that are not sales related, uh, but one is Tim Ferriss's blog and one is James Clear's blog. Um, so if people are just looking, they're both like really short and punchy, maybe three, four, five minute reads and they come once a week. Um, and James, oh, I'm going to guess, get this wrong. One of them wrote uh, Atomic Habits, which if you haven't read that book, maybe think about picking up the book as well. Um, God, I don't know. I am, I am what, so have you ever done the, uh, like the Strengths Finder one? You like Myers-Briggs. Have you done the Strengths Finder? I don't think I have. Eh, I, I, I have some, some disagreements with it, but I always think those types of personality uh, tests are, are pretty interesting. And one of my, you get five of your top strengths. You're supposed to lean into those. And one of mine, my number two actually is input. Um, and I'm such an input person. I love collecting information from tons of different sources. I love learning about tons of different topics. I love interacting with tons of different types of people. Like I'm a, I'm a big input. I'm constantly collecting information. So I'm all over the place from like a sales blog to like a Tim Ferriss, James Clear. There's a uh, uh, newsletter I love called CB Insights, but it's just about like startups and trends. I'm all over the place, Jason. That's good. That's good. You're talking about crunch, the crunch based one? Um, oh, I like, yeah, I like, I use Crunchbase a lot. I don't get their newsletter, but I do look up companies a lot on Crunchbase. Um, I would say CB Insights is the closest to that. And they reference Crunchbase data a lot because Crunchbase all obviously follows like the funding journey yeah. a lot more closely. Um, how, what's your favorite newsletter? Oh man. I mean, of course I listen to a lot of podcasts. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of eclectic too, right? I just, I just like whatever hits me, that hits my boat that day, right? Maybe it's like yeah. science. I've been a real big like psychedelics lately for some reason in astronomy. I think Joe Rogan is like a like great guest. Tim Ferriss is a great guest. Another guy I follow is a 
name is Lex Freedom. He's like a AI scientist out of Austin. Oh. He has some great guests. I'll send it to you. But yeah, just plus another thing, like, you know, is this another time suck, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's tough. I'm I'm a podcast person too, but I I tend to listen to uh like a stuff you should know or radio lab or mm. there's like every little thing and flash forward are my two favorite right now. And every little thing is like little tidbits of information and flash forward is a futurist podcast. I also um, like every single morning, look at what's on Blinkist. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'll do a, like, you know, it's a 15 minute, they read the highlights of a book to you. I'm brushing my teeth and probably not putting on makeup, but at least washing my face. <laughs> um, so I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I'm like all over the place in terms of the, the mediums it, of where I collect information, I'm all over the place in terms of the types of information that I, I like to collect and find interesting on a day to day basis. Yeah, there's so much great stuff out there. You just got you just got to find it. Mm -hmm. Sometimes there's too much great stuff out there, right? Because like, yeah, you know, the way you can you can consume it all. Yep, yep. And I love to read books, so sometimes I'm like, no podcast, no TV, no you know, no Blinkist, no anything. I just need to sit here with my physical paper book that smells like an, you know, old library and just be in that moment. <laughs> Leslie, understand you have something for our listeners today. Yeah. So I went ahead, we were talking earlier about the Unleash um, Your Potential Playbook. And I went ahead and took a bunch of stuff um, like out from being gatekept. So there's, you can access it without paying for the playbook. You can access it without even giving me your, your email address. Um, so some of the, the big ones that I think folks would find useful um, as I took like getting hired faster on LinkedIn um, out from behind the gatekeep wall. I took um, building your professional brand on LinkedIn uh, in an hour off. There's a quick start guide to content creation that I took out from behind the password wall. Um, so take, take advantage. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it out from behind the password wall for at least another, I would say week or two. So go, you know, take advantage. So uh, Leslie, can you share your social media link so people can reach out to you? Or yeah. Yourself and your company? Yeah. I won't make you pronounce sales tips talk again, which, you know, it looked really good on paper until people started pronouncing it. And I was like, oh my word, Leslie, way to just give them a tongue, tongue twister, but sales tips talk on TikTok. Uh, you can find me on LinkedIn at Leslie Vinets. Um, and make sure that you mention that, that you heard me on, on, you know, Jason's live, um, and I'll accept and we can be connected. And those are my, yeah, my two primary channels. And of course the playbook. And for our listeners, we'll have the link to our gifts and our social media on our show notes. Find the show notes at www.cavendishhrblog.com. And be sure to share this episode with your friends and subscribe to the Jason Cavins experience. So Leslie, we'll come to the end of our talk. It was a great time with you. Can you give us any wisdom or advice on anything you want to talk about? Oof, this was a good talk. You hit me with some hard questions. <laughs> I feel like usually I'm on, uh, you know, chatting with, with uh, salespeople and their, their questions, no offense, are kind of predictable and, and yours were not today. So thanks for keeping me on my toes. Um, takeaways. I would say one is that take action piece. Like the, the just create that momentum. If, you, if you're thinking about doing something, if you wanna do something, take that first step. And I promise that will help carry you forward. I would say for my salespeople out there that lead with emotions, follow with the logic, follow with the data piece is a small change that you can make in the way you talk and the way you communicate value that will yield huge results for you. I think an always reminder is don't, don't be too quick to buy into some of those narratives around entrepreneurship at all costs and, and like toxic hustle culture. Um, give yourself some grace to figure it out and um, certainly make sure that it is right for you, like emotionally, mentally, financially before taking some of those big steps. But then when you're ready, circle back to, take action. <laughs> so maybe those are, are kind of three tidbits I'd, I'd leave us with. Leslie, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Jason. It was my pleasure. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.